Good to be back with you. I was gone last week. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. I heard part of the message. I was in downtown Mobile, Alabama. Did you realize that's how windy that city is? I did a wedding, beautiful wedding for a, um, you, some of you know Nicole, our dear girl that actually lived with us in the 80s, one of the 13 teenagers that lived with us back then throughout in different periods of time. And she's like part of our family. And her daughter, her 27-year-old daughter got married, um, Matthew and Brianne, and they asked me to come up and do the wedding. So we drove up. Um, got there Thursday because there was sickness in their home. We didn't want to get there before that. Stayed, spent the night in a hotel in Atmore, Alabama. There's only three hotels. This one happened to be a casino. Um, just happened to be. That's all I'll say really about that. <laughs> and um, spent the night there. And um, I didn't take church money with me, don't worry. And, 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 um, and so, and, and then we went to... Um, uh, mobile the next morning and we stayed in the bed and breakfast for two nights my wife was the wedding coordinator which we didn't really quite know that until we got there and um, but it, it so it was sort of thrust upon us and it was an outdoor wedding they actually took over the bed and breakfast and had the whole street so they blocked off the whole street it was actually a really cool venue um, they made up two big curtains with the veil and the tool and all that and the aisles, white chairs, and the bride could walk down. And I was underneath another one of those big um, structures um, with all the tool and all that with a chandelier that's outside. They ran over the tree and it was right over us. It all lit up, beautiful, absolutely stunningly beautiful setting till four minutes before the wedding. Four minutes before the wedding, a gust of wind came down that street, and we, we were just standing there, the, the groomsmen, I'm about to lead them down the aisle, and the bride just doesn't even see anything, she's in the house, and those, those big structures went poof, poof, just went right down. Wood snapped, crackled, popped, it was, um, it was four minutes before the wedding. When it's gone 3.30, this was like 3.24 or something like that. So we got two of the... Um, Four guys, they picked it back up. I think one guy had a drill gun on him and fixed, fixed, fixed. It's Alabama, you know. And then, and then and they, and they fixed it, and um, and they jacked them up. And then we put two guys behind me, and I, because it was, it was wobbly and it was still pretty windy out, holding on for dear life. And two little girls on the on the one like. Just holding it like that, and that bride just comes right down the aisle. Had no idea till till after what what had happened. Her veil was so when her veil goes flying off, and she didn't know it. And um, her mom picks up the veil and then like that, and um, and then halfway through the ceremony, another gust of wind, just like the it was there. It was windy all day, but these two gusts happened right there at that 3.30, 3.26, and somewhere in the middle of the marital vows, it was um, this other gust came, and um, the guys, I hear the guys, big guys, whoa, whoa. They're like trying to hold on to this thing because it was like a parachute at that point, and then the chandelier's going, and the bride, poor bride, Bree, she looks at me and goes, is that going to fall? <laughs> so I reached up and grabbed it, and it didn't fall. And um, and a half hour after that gust of wind came, they, they were husband and wife. <laughs> they were married. <laughs> it was great. It was one of my funnest things I've ever done. I've had a wedding. <laughs> it wasn't fun at the moment, but as you look back on it, and the bed and breakfast was a really cool place, pretty cool place too. Hey, we're going to start a new series today. This is going to go on for a bit. Um not sure how long, six, seven, eight weeks. Um, it's, it's something I've been working on for probably six months. Um, this thinking, how do we, how, well, there's no question that we're living in a post-Christian era in America. I think we know that, don't we? Um, um, there are 1,400 churches, give or take, closing every month, 1,400. But just some good news, there are 1,500 new churches beginning. If you look around St. Petersburg, there's new churches popping up everywhere. The problem um, that with that is usually those new churches last under two years. Because basically, the, the people that are getting into these churches, this is not a criticism at all. I'm just trying to frame what the church of Jesus Christ in America is facing today. That's all I'm trying to do. Because um, that's what I do. I think, okay, how this is what we do. We're, we had a mandate. 
So they'll last in two to three years, these new churches, because really the people going in these churches are from churches like us and other people. They just keep trying that church. The people are going to more of a consumerism. What does this church offer me? And I, and I half understand that. If I have three kids, I want a youth ministry for my three kids. I get it. I mean, not, not a criticism. I'm, I'm just pointing out what we're facing. Um, churchianity, um, I'm going to use two terms today. That, that one you know, churchianity, that's what we're doing now. And there's another term, Christendom, which is the same thing. In my mind, they're the same thing. So the synonyms, if I use one or the other, I mean the same thing. What we're doing here right now, this is churchianity. Nothing wrong with this at all. We're gathering. The scriptures tell us to gather. We're hearing the word of God. We're worshiping. We're praising and all those things. Churchianity, as we know it, is ending quickly. It's um, re largely rejected by the upcoming generation. We know as the millennials. Woo millennials we're going to talk about those guys in a little bit so they're going to come up they look and they're looking for a new expression they see this what we're doing here on sunday morning as sort of non-relevant and and um i i want to say they're they're partly right i think what we're doing is very relevant but they think there's is more to it than this and i think that's why um they they are leaving the church in groves. Now, John 17, 18 says, just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. God, this famous John 17 prayer, Jesus Christ is sending who into the world? The disciples and us. So there's a mandate God was given us, go into all the world with the gospel. There's a mandate there, isn't it? God told us to go into all the world with the gospel. That's part of our Christian faith. Now, I wanted to spend a bit of time on that because when I look at my Christian faith, I, I want to look, okay, this is, this is a, um, in a sense, a subjective faith. I, what is Jesus doing for me? Well, he saves me. He gives me hope. He gives me peace. He takes away the fear of death. I can give all these wonderful things that my Christian faith gives me. But what's, the, what's something that we happen to, I think a lot of Christians, especially who've been in churches for a long time, leave out of the equation. Not only does God give us this incredible gospel and this incredible life and an indwelling Holy Spirit, he also gives us a mandate, a mandate to take our faith into the world and give it away and help grow the church. That's, that's this big a part of what Jesus did and what he left us with is anything else. We leave that part out. Again, I'm not criticizing. I, I, I preach at mirrors, my, my mirror. I don't preach at other people. I, I, don't, I think you guys are awesome, but I, I don't think we always include that into um, everything else that God has given us. We include going to church. We include prayer. We, we love truth. We love applying truth to our life. But one of the things that completes our Christian life is to give our Christian life away. And without that, we're living sort of a un, unfulfilled or incomplete. So I, I want to move this particular series, and we've been talking a lot about grace the last month and a half, two months. I want this series to move our thoughts from personal needs and what Jesus is doing for me, and, the, and we're going to be praying and, and doing stuff we've always done, but into a kingdom vision. What place do I have in the kingdom of God? How can God use me? Um, People are attracted to the authentic, uh, not as much as the commercial and Christianization of the secular. Even the churches that are attracting a lot of people in groves because they have, um, I'm not a criticism, really isn't, stage lighting and programs and groups and all those wonderful things. That's nothing wrong with that stuff. It's attracting people. Um, but that, again, is sort of a Christianization of the secular. It's okay as long as people are really being ministered to. But a lot of people are leaving those churches now because they ask questions like this. Why do we want to spend all that money on a smoke machine and lights and all these stuff and, and when there's people living in the streets of our own city? Good question, huh? Three questions I, I want to pose. 
how are we to grow in this post-Christian era that the church in America finds itself in? That's the question, I think. How are we going to grow as a church, Grace Connection Church? So we have to answer that. How do we grow? Number two, how did the early church grow from 5,000 to 5 million in, I said, 300 years in a sometimes very hostile, most of the time, very hostile, non-Christian world. We live in a post-Christian world. They live in a non-Christian world. Now, that's probably 300 years. It's probably close to 250 years. And number three, could the key to resuscitating the church, and I'm talking about the American church and this, this local assembly just being part of it, be as simple as to go back 2,000 years, back to the beginning, and look at and practice what the early church practiced? It's worth a look at, isn't it? It worked for them. They had a non-Christian world. We have Christian radio. We have Christian TV. We have social media. We have a, a ton of stuff that helps us promote our Christian faith in the world that we're living in, but the early church didn't have nothing. They didn't even have paper. <laughs> How did it work? We know that um, Peter preached a message, he got a bunch of people saved in the book of Acts, but what happened for the next 250 years? It wasn't always, um, he didn't have large gatherings. He didn't have a ch beautiful church building. He didn't have any of those things. He had homes and you just had Christians. So in the foreseeable future here, we want to look back and examine some of the practices and beliefs of the early church and how, if possible, if possible, and not all this is impl implementable, can we implement them now in our current modern church? What can work then that could also work now? And we want to look at that because when I'm going to show you in a book in a moment, I was challenged. I read things in this book that stretched my faith. And, uh, and it's becoming more evident that the future of the church depends less on what happens Sunday morning and more on what goes on Monday to Saturday. And that's reversed of what it's been, hasn't it? Before, this was it. But in the early church, this wasn't it. It was, it was what was happening Monday through Saturday and Sunday for that. That's how they grew. Um, let me keep going here. There were hundreds, if not thousands, in the Roman era when Jesus came of religions. Most of them were just fly by night. They worshiped this God, that God, this God, that God, whatever. They, could, they didn't care who you worshiped as long as you worshiped Rome <laughs> along with them. Three stood out. One was called Romanism, Roman culture. One was Judaism. And then another one was identified as the, as the third way. And that's what I titled the message, the third way. That's what got me started on this series. I read a, a blurb from a book that talked about the third way, and I asked myself the question, what the heck is that? <laughs> so I read the blurb. I sent it out to Dr. Lewis. I sent it out to Pastor Goldworthy. I sent it to Johnny. We all read it. So this is intriguing. Now Colin's reading it, and I, I'm going to put the book. We can put the book up. It's called Resilient Faith. There it is. Gerald L. Sitzer. Now I think how the early church third way changed the world. And I want to give you a little background on this author because I think that's significant. He is an academic. He's one of the smart people. I know it's a little chilly in here. Guys, it's, um, it's, we have the temperature at 74 degrees. We didn't put it at 63 or anything like that. It's, but it's, for some reason, it's just chilly in here. But I'm okay. I'm, you can make, I'm only preaching two hours. The, well, the Patriots lost, so there's no reason for me to go home. <laughs> I can be here all day long. I can wait. I'll be here to baseball season now. <laughs> and, and so I wondered, what is this third way? Well, the third way was Christianity. It was something that um, Gerald Sitzer, I want to get back to him, because he went, he's a, taught in a seminary, taught church history. He was, a, again, an academic type of guy. That was his ministry. <clears throat> then he had personal tragedy in his life. 
I, I'm not sure what it is. I believe he lost his wife and was had three small children. I think it was, but I could be wrong on that. That that really wasn't the focus. But he had personal tragedy. He found himself really not doing that any longer. And then somebody challenged him. Or somebody posed the question: Why can't you take your academia, take it out of the seminary, and make it more practical for the average Christian? Um, and so he was challenged to write this book. It's fascinating. To me, it was fascinating because that's exactly what he did. It's a little heady in some places. A lot of church history stuff. Some of the stuff I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really focus on in this series was just a passing. Just He would just mention it and bypassing it by. Just mentioned certain things in the early church. But when I looked at it, I said, this is intriguing. That was even part of it. So with that said, here's a quote from Resilient Faith. It was known as the third way. The phrase comes from the early Christian period. This is Sitzer. The, the phrase comes from the early Christian period. To my knowledge, it first appeared in a second century letter written to a Roman official, a certain Denogenes. The author, we don't know his name or his identity, wanted to describe the particular nature of Christianity to a member of the Roman elite. He commended Denogenes' curiosity and assured him that he would do his best to answer his questions about Christianity. When he referred to the Christian movement as the new race, or third race, which I have chosen to identify as a third way. Denogenes was familiar with the phrase implying that it might have been coined by the Roman themselves to categorize three distinct and different religious ways of life. Roman, Jewish, and Christian. So the first way Denogenes would have known was the Roman way. Rome was good with you worshiping whatever you wanted to worship. Um, they had a, a place, a pantheon, where you could choose your god. But as long as the emperor got your worship and, and got your taxes, <laughs> they were good. Yeah, I don't care what you do. Just give me the same money and don't cause any trouble or we'll kill you. That was the Roman way. They were very elite. They were very sophisticated. In a sense, they were very American. Success, prestige, power, authority, world dominance. Not, I love our country. I'm just saying, in a sense, it parallels that what they knew. That was the first way. That's what they knew. Then you had the, then you had the second way, which was Judaism. Now, the Romans respected Judaism because the religion was ancient and it was enduring. And um, the Jews survived opposition for over a thousand years. And somehow, despite the opposition, they spread throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. So despite what we see in the New Testament, there were some cases where the Romans actually showed um, a lot of consideration to the Jews and honored their ancient old religion. And they were, they were far more integrated, integrated into Roman culture. A lot of Rome, Jews lived in Rome than we might think by reading the New Testament. But the real life at that point, the Jews were, they were, as long as they were kept under wraps, and we saw what happened, you know, in Jesus' time, um, they, they were accepted by the Roman elite. But then there was Christianity, a third way. And this was new. This wasn't a, a ancient religion. This started in, in 30 AD with this, this man named Jesus who died and they said he resurrected and his disciples went out preaching and teaching and doing these crazy things and doing miracles and just got Jesus and they had no way to disprove it. If you read other resources, you'll see some of these things are mentioned on extra biblical resources. So they, they ate the local food. They weren't like the Jews. They lived in the local neighborhoods. They wore the local styles of clothing. They shopped in the local grocery store market. They followed the local customs. They were very much acted and performed and like the Romans sort of did. Now let me give you this quote. I believe this is Sitzer. I'm not positive though. For Christians cannot be distinguished from the rest of the human race by country or language or custom. They do not live in cities of their own like the Jews. They do not use a particular form of speech, like the Jews. They do not follow a, a eccentric manner of life. They live in their own countries, 
but only as aliens. They have a share in everything as citizens and, and endure everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is the fatherland, and yet for them, every fatherland is a foreign land. That's how the Romans looked at the third way in Christians. They were a nation within a nation, culturally assimilated, yet distinct in the same way. They constituted a new race of people, according to what the Romans were. They saw a spiritual kingdom, not of this world, but over this world. <clears throat> they viewed themselves as alien residents. The third way was like a resistant movement. That's why the Romans were interested in it. In 300 AD, when Constantine was converted to Christianity, that's when it all changed. So we're talking all pre-Constantine times. It was both subversive, it was subversive, and it was also peaceful. It, it wasn't, they didn't have Christian zealots trying to kill Romans. Bearing witness, they just bore witness to God's coming kingdom. But rather than following a strategy of violent revolutions like the zealots did, Christians immersed themselves in the culture, watch this, as agents of the kingdom. Fascinating. Christians aspired to follow another way, Jesus' way. They prayed for the emperor, but they refused to worship the emperor. By 40, in 40 AD, there was about 5,000, as we already said, and there was 5 million by 250 AD, worshiping in some 65,000 house churches that just popped up around Rome. So Christians then enjoyed, didn't have the event, they didn't have a church building to come to. They just found people in homes. They, they, they didn't have Christian radio get the word out. They didn't have mass evangelism. They didn't have mailings. They didn't have any of those things. They just lived. They farmed, they lived, they shopped, and, um, and then they, and they had a, a culture within a culture. And it's that culture within the culture that the world found attractive. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the coming weeks. <clears throat> they had this plan to move people they didn't care about political muscle. Let me just say a little bit about that. They didn't care about the evangelical vote. They weren't trying to get their guy into Rome. I'm not against political activism. I'm really not. Not against vote for who you want to vote for. I'm not against any of those things. But I'm just saying that was never the focus of the church. The focus of the church was not to overthrow Rome. The focus of the church was not to replace the emperor. The focus of the church was to win souls one by one in their circle of influence. So they had this plan, and it was a slow plan, a deliberate plan, and we're going to be looking at that from participation in Greco-Roman religion or Judaism into a Christian fold. And there was one major reason for a success. This process, as we'll see over the next few weeks, enabled the movement to adapt to many different cultural settings but never losing its essential identity and never losing its purpose. We have created our own Christian culture here in this era. We, we have expected people to come meet us where we're at. And that's worked pretty well for us for the last five decades, six, seven, eight, nine, de 10 decades, for the last hundred years. But we've moved on, I think, my friends, as a country. And I'm just speaking about America because it's different all over the world. We expect people to come meet us where we're at. The third way lived where they were at and met the people where they were at. So let's fast forward today. Okay, enough of the history. Let's fast forward today into Christendom, churchianity. Um, which being, you know, Christ, being a Christian is relatively normal, easy, convenient, a little less than it used to be. I mean, you do get a little slack today in America, some bad press. Somebody just, somebody um, called us a bad name recently um, in the government, didn't like us because of whatever. I don't even know why, but um, probably because we didn't vote for them. But it was, that's probably it. And, um, but, but being, I'm a Christian, that's relatively normal. I grew up in a Christian denomination. I wasn't a Christian, but I went to a Christian church growing up because it was just a normal thing. On Sunday, you get out of bed and you go to church, whether I wanted to go or not. I would give, be given a quarter to put in the offering plate. 
didn't always make it in the offering plate. But, 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 and, but, I, didn't, but I didn't know God. I didn't know God until um, you know, 10, 15 years later when I finally found 19 years old. The fact is, Christianity in America is declining in both numbers and influence. The culture is changing in America, 2020. We must therefore recognize we live in a very different world from the one that existed even a half a century ago. I don't think I need to convince anyone about this. I think you pretty much agree with me what I'm saying. This is a different world. And before what used to be the golden age of Christianity, that's when we had mass evangelism and the Billy Graham crusades and thousands of people coming to Christ and you fling the doors open of a beautiful sanctuary and people just come in and they worship and they would give and they would be part of that local community. That was great. That really was. I'm not criticizing that. But that was nothing resembling what the early church had to face. They didn't have any of that. And now we come to this generation, and this generation is sort of just going like, that's not really relevant for me. I'm not sure that's all there is to church. It's funny, because when I was saved... And, and I had stopped going to church, and I was a teenager, and I had my driver's license. I drove to the local, I was a Roman Catholic growing up. I drove to the local Roman Catholic church, and, um, and I went there for maybe a month, and I went through, that's all I ever knew. And it was New England, I think, I don't think Protestants were allowed in New England to this like a few years ago. And, um, and so, and I, and, I, and, I, and I remember leaving those masses, those services, being very confused and thinking, saying this to my, my friend who uh, we got saved together. I brought him with me and um, said, is, is that all there is to God? There has to be more than that. And that's before I heard real preaching and the power of God and anything like that. But I, I think that's the question a lot of people are asking now. Is that all there is to God? We come Sunday morning and we sing some songs and we're going to talk about that. Uh, we give of our resources, which we're going to talk about that a lot. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And, um, and, um, and then we hear the word, which is imperative, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but is that all there is to God? And then we go home and we just go back to our lives. Many in, the, in my generation, I guess I'm a boomer, and who's the generation after me? Before me. After me. Before me. After me. The ones that's older than me. Which was, whoever they are. I love you guys. And, um, and, and, they, and, and we look at the world and we, we sort of bemoan it. The state of the world. We can't believe the moral decay in our country. We can't believe the things that were being talked about in politics. Are you kidding? That would never even be mentioned 30 years ago and 40 years ago and 20 years ago. And now we're voting on it. Are you kidding me? And, and we're shocked that the world has gone from here to here. So dramatically and so quickly. See, this is the thing, is we, we are, power and isn't the best way to change culture. We can win the, the next, the duns and the nuns. I'm not talking about the women with a little flying nun or anything like that. So the nuns mean I have those who refuse to identify with anything that's religious. They see religion as the biggest problem in the world. Look at what's happening in the Middle East. Religion. I get it. It's not Christian religion, but religion. So how do we become relevant to the duns and the nuns? And this, even a good old-fashioned pagan unbeliever. <laughs> how do we reach them? Now, what about our favorite generation? The millennials. Because they're the ones coming up behind us. And this is important to our future. Here's a quote from a millennial seminary graduate from a reputable seminary. I can't for the life of me think of one good reason to believe in Christianity anymore or even God. It has become entirely irrelevant to my life. Hmm, that's sad. 
That's after you get the degree on the wall and study the Bible. Now, here's some of the things we're facing. We're facing indifference. That's even intellectual laziness. I don't mean, again, to be critical. Um, millennials will exhibit, exhibit a con, common concern and common good for society, and they, they have this tremendous um, aptitude towards volunteerism. They become very like social in a sense, like we want to help the culture, and they should. They're right about that. This needs to go beyond um, what we're doing here and, and start looking beyond this into what's happening out there. What's happening in our families, and how can the church implement that? What's happening with our youth? How can our church minister to them? Or the church, let me just say. So we're living in this time when it, I, could, I could bash the millennials all day long. They don't really make a lot of sense to me because they take a thought over here and they never follow the thought over here and they get really excited about this, this cause, but they don't understand, see the bigger picture. So I'm not saying, but that's our world. That's where we're living. And, they, they, and so it's our job as the church to help them, or to help whoever think through these things and see the bigger picture. So maybe we need to go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning of where our faith started and not try to hang on to what we had. It used to be this way. What well, That's being ripped out of our hands. This is how it used to work, but it's not working anymore. That's being taken away from us. It doesn't work like it used to work. So we got to rethink and it's challenging, especially when you've been thinking the same way for a long time. Rethink outside of our own comfort zone and say, how do we reach this world? Now, I, I'm rethinking some things in my own life, and I'm pretty conservative, non-emotional, pretty practical guy. I really, I, I, I go outside my lawn, people think I mow my lawn, I eat my grass. That's how, that's how down to earth I am. In other words, I, I'm, I'm just not subjective at all. And I, I have a tendency to repel subjectivity and emotionalism and stuff like that as being just that. To a fault, I do that, to a fault. But neither do I want to do that to a place where I, the Holy Spirit's going, dun, 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 and I'm knocking on my head saying, Tim, I want you to notice something. No, I'm not really comfortable with that. No, I want to have the, the idea to be connected enough to the Spirit. That God, wanted, you, you want to teach me something. You want to challenge me. You want to get me to another place in my life and my walk with you. I want to listen. I don't want to live my Christian life on my terms, Lord. I want to live my Christian life on your terms. And there's some things I've seen, I, we've discovered in the early church, which has rattled my cage a little bit. I did, never understood it. I never even saw it, didn't even know it existed, how they did certain things. I said, wow, would that work today? I think, yeah, that would work today. Now, we're doing a lot of things right. These classes Dr. Lewis teaches we're going to be meeting um, probably this week and the next few weeks talking about them. Those, those are very strategic. I, I would call them a, a, a continual or furthering education type of um, class. That was a big thing in the early church, a huge thing, even much more organized than what we're doing. But we offer those because we want our, our folks, we want you to have access to sound biblical teaching much more than you'll just get here on a Sunday morning because that's really not enough to, to go on. So maybe we go back to where we started. I've come to believe that one of those, resor those resources of, um, is knowledge of the early church history. We look back before we can go forward. We've discovered that this generation needs something different, doesn't it? Because they're growing up in a world that's very different from the one that I, I grew up in. No arguments there. It's just a different world. That's not bad. But the, the challenge is it's our fact, it's our job to adjust to the culture instead of expecting the culture to adjust to us. I'm not saying we adjust the message. You can't. I'm not saying you adjust the core principles of our Christian faith. You can't. 
But how do we practice this to make it appealing to the people over there? How do we do that? And then to bring people from infancy to discipleship, which was key. Now, let me just balance this a little bit. The early church has problems too. Just read the book of 1 Corinthians. <laughs> this, and as you read through all the Pauline epistles, they all had issues. They had issues with sin. They had issues with um, sexual sins. They had issues, same issues the church faces today. There was lukewarmness in the early church. Not everyone became a disciple. Not everyone took it serious. Um, they got sometimes there was power plays. There was manipulation. There was there was people um, hanging on to the position in the church. Same stuff that churches face today. It's going on back then too. So it's not a perfect model, but. They went from nothing to five million in 250 years with no help. All they had was each other. Something worked. Jesus left them a gospel to give away. And as a gospel of power, it was then, it is now. So let's conclude with this. And then we'll get into more practical stuff next week. Here's the essential point. The early Christian movement became known as the third way because Jesus himself was a new way, which in turn spawned a new movement, new in theology, new in story, in authority, in community, in worship, and in behavior. Christian belief was so new, in fact, it required Christians to develop a process of formation. In other words, they had a plan to take somebody from infancy to maturity. Um, they didn't reject the culture. They immersed themselves in the culture. Then they invited the cultures into their lives. And once the culture got into their lives and they saw that these, this group of people were weird, they had ideals that no one else has. Rome noticed because when there was a famine, everyone ran out, not a famine, but a plague. Everyone ran out of the Roman cities and the Jews ran, and the Christians ran in to the Roman cities. The Christians would take the elderly that were left to die, the Rome's elderly, and they'd take them into their homes. Christians would go find babies left to die on the street because the Romans didn't want them and they would take them into their homes and nurture them and raise them and adopt them. The Christians did everything the Romans would never do. That's why they got, gathered so much attention. That's why Denogenes was asking, hey, what is it with these guys? What makes them different? There's a quote from the second century, I believe, where a, a Roman priest was criticized because when this plague hit a city and the Christians ran in, and many of them died helping those dying, the Roman priest took off of the hills. And what's the difference? Well, the Christians knew they had a hope. <laughs> they knew they had a hope that, that death was just, okay. There was no fear attached to it. So we are entering to a point where we might not have the favor of the state. Um, we might be witnessing the end of Christendom, churchianity as we know it. 20 years, 30 years, as this generation, my generation dies, we, the, the, we're going to see the end of Christendom as we know it. That's how it's working, looking now. So we might want to look back and look at the Christians who lived before Christendom. How did we do it before churchianity? How did we make it happen? What do we have to do in-house and what do we have to do outside? They faced the challenge of introducing Christianity as new and radically different. And we face the problem and the challenge of trying to reclaim and restore a faith that's been plagued by lukewarmness, division, ignorance, nationalism, worldliness. How do we do it? 
Well, like I said, let's go back to the beginning. Let's see what worked for them and see what works for us. This is not going to be radically different. I mean, I'm not, six weeks from now, you're not going to think Pastor Kelly is absolutely crackers. He's, he's lost his marbles. Maybe it's all the sports he watches. Maybe he has, maybe he has a concussion by watching other people get concussions on TV or something like that. So, no, I, I don't think you'll find this um, hard to agree with. And, I, and not only that, I think you'll find it relatively exciting because they practice things. I think you're going to like practicing. They had the, and I, I want to say this again. We do. There's many things that I've looked in here that I said, we're doing that. We're okay there. We're okay there, and we're okay there. Some things I said, we're not doing that. So I'm not thinking we're doing a bad job here or anything. I'm just, I thought actually we had a lot of things in place. Our priorities are right. You guys, you guys are amazing in the sense that you, you adjust to change um, as well as any congregation I've ever seen. And that's probably due to me. <laughs> I'm always changing. I'm always got something screwing up. So, so there's um. So you guys do amazing. You're not stuck in the mold. You want to see your, your king, the kingdom of God being advanced. You want to see souls saved. You're not just about yourself. You're not about the show. You love the word. I love you guys. You guys are doing great. No, no complaints at all. But they're not. People aren't coming in through our doors anymore. People are going out. That's okay. That's between them and the Lord, and God calls people, moves people. They're his people. He can do what he wants with them. I'm not looking to, to bring new, new churches. I'm not looking to take disgruntled people from other churches into our church or do a better job at music or doing a better job at preaching or doing a better job with children's ministry. I'm not looking to do any of that. I just want to say, how do I reach the people that are living across the streets that are the nuns and the duns? How do we get them in here? Well, that's what we'll be working on. How do we get the nuns and the duns? That's where we want to grow. Because that's, that's real church growth. Not trading cards. I mean, it's true we do that. I have like little bios on all of you. And, I, and, um, and I've, I've, I've had like four roofers in the church. I was trying to trade two of you for a lawyer. But, um, but, but, but it's... But, so I, it's nothing wrong with that, but it's, um, no, we, no we, we just wanted to get folks come in here and say, now this is relevant. So with that said, Jesus, thank you for these words, and thank you for the precious people here. And, and thank you that I didn't preach too long this morning, Father. Thank you for that, because that was, had a potential of happening. Um, Father, bless that precious little baby, Jasmine. We pray for mommy and baby that they're healthy. Father, and that they get out of the hospital quickly. Father, and for Shannon and Jesse and had a little pregnancy too, Father. Pray for them that you would bless that pregnancy, especially with Shannon's um, health issues that she faces. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're on the webcast here or well, you're watching this message later on on YouTube, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, we'd like to give you that opportunity right now. Quiet place of your heart. Say this prayer after me. Somehow, Dear Jesus, thank you for coming into my life and saving me. Father, today I understand it all starts with salvation. And salvation is a free gift, an extended hand out to me. Come into my life and save me, Father. Today I want to be part of the family of God, the kingdom of God. If you've said that prayer in your own way, in your own words, between you and God, and salvation is an individual, private thing, between you and God happens in a quiet place of your high minds and hearts. You can say things out loud. That doesn't matter. But God knows your heart. If you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, let the person who brought you here know or let us know on the way out. We just want to rejoice with you. Father, we delve into this message and this series, and we're, we're a little bit of fear and trembling because it's, it's different. I mean, for me it is. It's we're going to be exploring some things I have never explored. And, and Father, we just give us wisdom. Give us the ability to make these next six or seven weeks, however long it is, more doable and practical and real. Father, 
Bless our local church. Bless the precious people here. Bless those that are dealing with so many health issues. And I prayed about one already this morning. Serious health issue, Father. Bless them. Bless the finances of our church, Father. As we, um, obviously it's a big piece of property and small congregation. So, Father, bless that too, we pray. We love you, Lord. Thank you for the insight. Thank you for the passion. Never to settle. Never to settle for status quo. Never to settle for what we think we know. Never to settle for how we used to always do it. <clears throat> Father, we all have preferences. But there, there's that preferences. They're not convictions. They're not mandates. They're preferences. And that's okay. But Father, help us put our preferences below the mandate of us being sent into your world. Bless the word of God to our hearts. Bless the offering we're about to share. In Jesus' name.